spread the fire welcome back to smwx and today i'm excited because i get to ask questions of the people who ask questions and i'm joined by some of the most incisive and engaging and fascinating journalistic minds that our country has to offer and it's such a wonderful honor to welcome onto smwx matsiri somadia the voice of political reporting on news 24 <laughs> karen morn uh, untangling legal and political webs at Diesel Black Star, and Aldrin Sampir, the People's Bay of the Media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on ENCA. Thanks so much for joining me. It's really great to have you. It's it's an honor. So, don't look so nervous, guys. You always asking questions. <laughs> What's going on? Not used to be on the okay. other side. It's very strange. <laughs> We're just still digesting people's bay of the media <laughs> <laughs> and appreciating that. Also, I yeah. subscribe. I like yes. Still with the people's bay <laughs> of the media. <laughs> um, you know, in the media, in an election um, in South Africa, you experience the most, let me put it that way. And I'm just interested to hear from your perspective. You know, recently we just had this whole Jesse Duarte fiasco and what it's been like for you and take us behind the scenes, you know, because we see your writing, we see your reporting, we see you on the screen, but a lot of people don't understand what it's actually like to cover an election that's this contentious um, in a country that is this unequal and how that feels and just what you've seen reporting on this, this crucial election. Should I start? Okay, yeah. I'll just start. Um, you know, when they, when they say Christmas is a silly season, normally election season is a silly season. Um, the strange thing about the 2019 national elections, though, is that they're slightly muted. Um, parties, I think they don't have money. A lot of them will talk, oh, we don't have money to campaign. So because of those dynamics around resources, it's not as crazy as it normally is. Usually by this time, we're about, what, a few weeks away, four or five weeks away from elections. Usually you are incredibly exhausted because you've been running around. There are endless protests, there are endless issues that South Africans are taking up and wanting them resolved immediately because we're going to elections. You are exhausted because you're literally crisscrossing the country with different political parties. It hasn't been, it's not a full force, full might yet. You know, they tell you about the big ANC machinery. It hasn't been cranked to its fullest efforts yet. I think. In my head, I'm preparing myself for the next couple of weeks. I think when we hit the 30-day mark, the 20-day mark, it's going to get a bit insane. It's going to get insane. And then you'll have election day, and then you'll have those wonderful days at the IEC's rock, um, at the results center where you're not sleeping. You sleep much, much like days later, and then you're exhausted, but elated to have covered an incredible process. I think it is muted, but it is interesting because um, of how you see parties trying to work around the lack of resources to try and campaign. Just to stay with you quickly as well, because you were mentioned in this recent uh, saga, and, and what's, it, what's it like to, to have politicians call you out by name, the, the Twitter sphere, and just a lot of the, the pressure that's brought to bear from, from multiple sides. I've even started feeling it with this <laughs> little show that we have here. You know, what's that been like um, from your perspective? So you can almost dissect the different uh, people you're dealing with. So for instance, with politicians, it's expected. We know that they're not our friends. I don't expect a politician to be my friend. So when they go off at me, it's perfectly fine. I'm up for it, by the way. Often when a politician wants to attack me for one thing or another, I have a quick comeback, and I have a reason why I'm asking particular questions. I have a reason why I'm pursuing particular angles. Very often we find ourselves in, 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 contentious, in a contentious space with politicians. It's not abnormal. It is part of the job. Is Jessie Duarte problematic? She is. She's known to be problematic. She's gone off at everybody. Um, Santiago Maseko from ENCA mentioning my name in their, in their engagement didn't come as a surprise to me because he's right. I was called a hater. He was there. We are used to it. Because uh, you, you get told you're a hater, and you go, that's fine about my question because I'm here for a reason. So you don't get confused when you're dealing with politicians. I think that's how you navigate politicians. Now, social media. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter streets. So Twitter is a difficult one because you get insulted for how you look, how you breathe, how you ask particular questions, how you frame particular stories, what media house you represent. So you get attacked for a number of reasons. And you get attacked sometimes based on who says what to in terms of the politicians. Because you've got the EFS Julius Malema, who's very um, fingers first, so he's very quick on Twitter. You've got Tigilem Balula. And whatever they say, their followers will multiply. Like, yo, I can't, I can't explain how they echo their sentiments, you know? So it'll take one politician going, you know, news24.com. 
and you'll, you'll be called a Stratcom agent for the next three, four weeks in a row. And it's not like every other day, it's every other hour there's someone who's attacking you for one thing or another. You make an observation about what's happening in the ANC. For instance, I'm very big on talking about how I feel Cyril Ramaphosa is campaigning alone. I've written opinion pieces, analysis about it. I know that they've had arguments about it within the ANC as well, what I've seen on the ground. And people are like, yeah, you're just out to attack the ANC. So there's mm. no right move sure, as far as social sure. media is concerned. No, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Karen, you, you've been on the legal side of reporting more than the political, but obviously those two things intersect often. What's, what's it been like? visiting ubaba as well <laughs> just <laughs> what's no, it been just, like I, yeah. I just would like to echo what cd is um, talking about i think the environment has become really toxic for journalists mm. i think that um in well actually anyone who has an opinion in south africa and that's not a that's not a thing that's reserved for us that's a global thing i mean these uh, what's i find so ironic is that you see um you know and it, the eff does it as well attacks on journalists um and you know making an issue a personal one when there are questions to answer and it really depresses me on some level because i think wow surely people can see beyond this that as cd says we have questions that's our job guys we're, we're not we're not coming into your environment to ask you the questions that you want to answer we're here to like really understand the issues and to understand them in a way that is meaningful for us so we can communicate them to the public. But oftentimes you may cover an issue in a completely factual way, but instead of engaging with the facts, you're going to have to defend your agenda. Mm -hmm. And that is problematic for me because people who are in this industry are passionate about this idea that you can explain and get to some semblance of what truth is and you can have philosophical debates about this. But people in the journalism space, people like CD, people like Aldrin, they suffer massively for this job. I mean, it's not an easy thing. You, it's hard, it's long hours, it has personal consequences for people. And I just sometimes, I mean, my thing is now to just put, you know, shitloads of filters on my Twitter. Mm -hmm. So that I just like, I mean, I get the occasional dive, die, die, bitch, die. I mean, it's like, can we have a tutorial? No, no, after no, no this, I will so show you. I will show you guys. Yeah. No, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of filters that you can put, but it's so fascinating to me because I spoke to a very powerful judge and a fees must fall activist within a space of a few days to me. And both of them spoke about the damage that social media has done to them psychologically and emotionally. And the judge said that, and he's given some very seminal judgments on a number of issues. His son, in KZN, checks social media and phones him every morning to see he's alive. Because wow. he's scared his dad is gonna get killed. Wow. How is this where we are? Yeah, like, yeah. we are a democracy. We get, people get to have different opinions. And you know, I always quote CJ McQueen, like, you can criticize me. We're not precious about it, mm -hmm. but please be specific. Just say, Karen, you know, the way, the way that you've unpacked this issue on X, Y, Z, I find problematic because this is not the applicable legislation or I feel that you're showing bias by not looking at this. I can handle that. But when your whole rhetoric is about how I'm just a Stratcom agent or an evil person and I must die or be raped, I mean, I've had that quite a few yes, times, you, um, you know, that the females get that a lot, then I'm just kind of left wondering, what is it that you're after? Like... Because I'm here to be part of like building or understanding the society that I'm in, and I'm really intent on that. But you just seem to be out there to mm. be toxic and poisonous, and I'm not sure that's useful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Aldrin, from, from your perspective, also interesting that sometimes when you have to deal with all this stuff, then you suddenly also have to go in front yeah. of a camera yeah. and, and appear as if everything's fine. What's it been like covering this election and just also in the social media era that we're in. And, and here's the thing about the era that we're in. South Africa is so highly and heavily politicized that the politics, the ripple effects are in the newsroom during diary meeting. The ripple effects can be felt um, from the Twitter sphere. The ripple effects can be felt during a press briefing as well, that uh, you walk into a press, press briefing room and uh, people frown. Oh, hulo na futi. Yeah, ufunan. I wonder who sent you. And, and that's the other thing that you need to deal with as, as reporters is that people believe that you don't have agency. Um, they believe that the certain question that you're asking is a question that you ask because somebody sent you to ask that specific question. 
instead of believing in you having your own personal agenda, that this is the agenda that I have and this is the angle that I want to take on this particular story because this is how I see it. And we face a lot of that. And what people don't understand when they watch TV specifically is that there's a whole lot of other shit that we face when the cameras are off mm. and we have to filter that. Mm. And I was making this example on Twitter that you don't understand that I have to watch somebody die like in Maragana, for instance, I wasn't there, but I'm just speaking a, 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 as, a, as a reporter. You watch somebody die in Maragana, police shooting at these people. There they are, these miners are dying, and you're watching these people die. And then you have to go on camera and tell the story of how these people died without showing the visuals because now you need to filter that mm -hmm. because you are trying to protect your viewers from seeing these horrific scenes. Mm -hmm. But I have seen it. I have seen it, and then I need to go home when you get home and then you still get the attacks that you and you still sometimes you get the, the phone calls because some of these yeah. people have your numbers mm -hmm. and they call you out and tell you about how what a terrible reporter you, you are you get calls from like people high up on you, do, you do you yeah. do they, they'd ask you wh why did you take this specific angle is this the only thing that you could see um, mm -hmm. important in this particular press briefing and that's the other thing that we uh, probably at, at some point we're gonna we, we, we should reach as, 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 as the media is that just because Tiso Black Star and, uh, and all their papers are running a specific angle on a story doesn't necessarily mean that I should be running that angle as well as on, on ENCA or on News 24 should be running that angle on, 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 on News 24. We, have, we are different people, we've got our different agencies and we've got a different thought processes about how we come to specific angles. And it becomes really, really difficult when some people expect us to have what Tiso Black Star has, what News 24 and what News 24 has. We are not the same. We are all informed, and, uh, and this is something that people tend to forget, that the de final decisions that we take sometimes in a newsroom are all informed by our different backgrounds. Um, Karen might not find um, a particular story interesting. I find it interesting. Mm. And that does not mean that the story is not interesting. Mm. Just because a specific reporter or a specific politician didn't find what you did on a particular story not interesting. So I think it, it's fascinating just to hear these stories because just as a citizen, I watch you, I listen to you, I read what you write, but you never think of what it's actually like to be the person who's, who's behind that. What do, you, what do you say to, okay, I think firstly, you know, these, these threats of sexual violence are ab abhorrent, illegal, and we should never condone anything like that. Mm. But as people in the media, as people in the public space, who also dish out a fair amount as well, mm -hmm. to what extent do you think this notion that as soon as the media is attacked, it becomes a prominent story? I is there any weight to that? Or do you think that um, you need to develop, you know, politicians say, no, you're in the media, just develop a thick skin. skin yeah. How do you feel about that response to, to the kinds of stories that you've been sharing here now? I'm kind of divided, sorry. I'm, I'm personally kind of divided because on some level I do agree with them. I do think, particularly political journalists, you are going into a very difficult space. Again, these are not your friends. To some extent, you must also be prepared that you know they're going to dish it out and you must maybe either fight it or take it. I do understand that. But I think when you're speaking about attacks on media and how we do rally around each other, I think that sometimes is important because often we're protecting a principle, by the way. If you pay attention to a lot of what the journalists stand for when they're standing up for a particular journalist, if you're paying attention, it's not about the individual. It's about the principle of being allowed to function and to work in a democracy openly. So we must be allowed spaces to do what we do. Um, it's been hard fought for. It's, it's a hard won liberty that we deserve as far as I'm concerned. Um, just going back to the issue, though, of the particular issues, how we how we railing around them. Beyond the issue of principle, what you find is it will be an extraordinary story almost that leads to us one be it becoming a story and us then railing around an individual. I am thinking, and now Twitter is going to start. This is the part where Twitter starts going, "Yeah, Karima Brown spokesperson." I think about the threats that she got from people who align themselves with the EFF. And I remember even asking Julius Malema because someone said, "But they're saying that the EFF members." And he argued, "Yeah, but it's fake news. It's an era of fake news." And I said, "But they said they do it in your name." Because that's what, that's what you also need to understand is that whether or not they're EFF members, they're doing it in your name. And we cannot keep quiet 
when a rape is a threat. Because somebody else from the EFF said to me, why are you not commenting on what happened between Jesse Duarte and Sam Kela, but you commented on Karim. And I said, I don't think there's a point where we must keep quiet about sexual violence. Yeah. It's a very different issue for me. But as far as the back and forth between journalists and politicians, I'm also very quick to call the journalists, by the way, to say, one, are you okay? Yeah. Two, you know, you know, in this field, in the space that we operate in, these things do happen. And either I'll say chin up or be strong or you'll be fine, because I also do understand that. Um, we're not defending politicians being difficult. Like, Jesse is unnecessarily difficult. That is a fact. We're not defending her. It's just that that's part of the terrain that we operate in, and you, you, have, um, you have some sort of knowledge of, of the field that you're in. I have also the patience, by the way, for younger journalists entering our, into our space to try and say to them, you know what? You will come across things like this. I think part of what we fail to do often is to, sh to, to recognize what potential teaching moments are. Yeah. So because, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting to see you acknowledge that there is that balance because I think sometimes it comes across as, and, and the media is being attacked unjustifiably and it almost comes across as like a lager mentality. But seeing the nuance of the fact that you appreciate where you are, but also that there are certain bounds that, that aren't to be crossed, I think is probably the more, the more mature conversation. I mean, my thing is like, look, you know who we are, you know our faces, you know our names. Um, and I feel like to say that it's okay for you who are standing behind a name that's not your own and an anonymous picture mm -hmm. to hurl kind of all kinds of insults at me and to say that I deserve to be die to die or be raped or whatever, mm -hmm. that's not a debate, guys. I want a debate. I think debates yeah. are useful. And debates. the thing is, like, yeah. we're not defensive. Like, you must hear, like, the media is not like this hegemonic little beast that we all, like, you know, we all agree on everything. Oh. We will have, like, TD and I will fight. Like, Aldrin and I will, media. yes, we will, <laughs> we will. Yeah. We have like mutual respect for each other, but CD, like we know that there are issues that, you know, she has a very different perspective on. Yeah. We're not defensive, we're not precious, we're not fragile, but there's a major division, d d uh, sort of, there's a major difference between mm -hmm. having a reasonable debate where I know her, I respect her, but I disagree with her, she disagrees yeah. with me, and we give each other the space to do that. Um, and then just hurling insults at someone and saying, you know, basically this person is, is, is can't talk because there's a culture of silencing that's happening right now where the loudest voices on the social media space are the most vicious and the most extreme. And a lot of people are looking at this and going, I don't want to get involved in this. I don't, I have a perspective, it's nuanced, it's interesting, but I'm not going to express myself because I fear the pile on. And that is a loss to our yeah. democracy. And in fact, sorry, just very quickly, in fact, there are journalists who are going off of social media. Exactly, yeah. because they can't deal with it. It becomes really difficult. And, and here's the thing about what CD is saying, mm. is <laughs> we always have this discussion around we can never become the story as a journalist mm. because mm. the story is always bigger than me. There's so much that happens behind the scenes that do not get on camera, they do not get into the newspaper. Mm. CD would have her sit down with whichever politician and there would be something that happens mm. on the side and she'll tell me about it. But you won't see it in the paper, guys. Karen Mon would do the same. That's but you don't, but you don't see it. in. Done. Yeah, yeah. Th there are That's things that you don't know. Yeah. There's some Gela incident, which um, I'm partly glad it happened live on television so that people could see what we yeah. go through. Yeah. Yeah. It happened live on television and there was no way that you could filter that out or even, b uh, or even um, what do they call it, or gag that. Yeah. Because it was live on television. This was live television unfolding as everyone was watching. Mm. And that's what reporters go through on, 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 on a daily. But we do not report about that. I'll tell you one incident that please, happened with please. me. Please, please, and feel um, free to share names. <laughs> feel free to share there whatever names. There are many names. stories. There yeah. are many stories. Because you guys are like, there are incidents. I'm like, yeah, okay. There are so many There are, there are many so many, many incidents, incidents. Wow. guys. This is, a, this is a safe space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one will come and troll you. <laughs> so we do a lot of investigative stuff as well as, as political reporters. And I came across um, the Inspector General's report on the so-called rogue unit. Mm. Somebody showed it to me, I read it, and then I confronted the minister, Public Enterprises Minister Praveen Godan on it. Like, this is what this report is saying. What do you say about it? Um, his mm. response to me, which was on air, was, um, well, let them arrest me, but 
it's quite interesting how some of these documents are falling in the hands of certain people, mm. ready customers, Persians. Um, when the camera was off, or while, w while we were not recording the interview, which the audio is still there, um, he then asks me, Who's your, who, who are your sources? Mm. Who are the people who are feeding you this information? Um, you have a certain narrative that you're trying to push about state capture. Instead of asking difficult questions about state capture, you're asking me this. And then he walks off and he says that I'm never speaking to you again. Hmm. And those are the stories that don't get on TV. Yeah, yeah. But the next thing is that the next press briefing or the next incident that I might have with, with, with Pravin Godan, I will have to ask him a certain question because I still need to make sure that I continue being a journalist, yeah, being the journalist that yeah. asks some of those tough questions mm -hmm. and some of those difficult questions that, um, that some politicians Actually, don't want to ask. Now you're making me worried about this show, hey? Because no, don't be worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a safe space. That's, that's <laughs> he said it's a safe <laughs> space. Yeah, exactly. that, that's so fascinating because like, from being a citizen to being someone who actually has to ask those questions, I suddenly realize like all the anxieties that come with you may even have a, a relationship with someone from before, but now you have to perform your actual ethical duty to get to the bottom yeah. of this. And you have to have an ongoing relationship exactly. after that. Yeah, um, yeah any, any other similar feelings or, or, or thoughts like that? Um, we're going to continue with these spicy stories uh, in part two. But thanks so much for joining us for part one. And make sure you catch the bonus content that comes out on the WhatsApp channel. It's just starting to get lit. I hear you. SMWX. No young people are around the decision making table. Let some new voices come to the fore. Follow us on WhatsApp and catch us live Tuesdays and Thursdays. Out with the old, in with the new. SMWX.